turn in your Bibles to the 19th chapter of the book of Genesis uh, as we continue our study through the Word. So Abraham is 99 years old. That's old. Uh, so, you know, never trust anybody over 30. But now, that, I mean, that is 99. And, and the Lord comes to him and tells him, you're just getting started, Abraham. <laughs> you haven't even had the son of promise uh, yet. He's got Ishmael, and Ishmael's about 12 years old, and and he thinks that he's got the son of promise. You remember that he takes his handmaid and Sarah is the one that, you know, kind of comes up with that plan. And, and now the Lord comes to him and, and tells him that hey, the descendants that he's going to have is going to come through Sarah. And, and he, he laughs. He just, it's just like, can, can this possibly be? How can this be? And you remember he gives the sign of circumcision now to be a sign of the covenant. That this, through Sarah, this is going to be the covenant child. Now, remember why this is important. This is all important. The lineage of Abraham is important because you're looking at the lineage of the Messiah, uh, of Jesus Christ, the Redeemer, who he is going to send. And so we we are watching the way that God first calls uh, Abraham. He's going to make a nation from him. And then from that nation, we are going to uh, see that Jesus is going to uh, come forth. And so uh, Ishmael was not from the couple, was not from Sarah and Abraham. And so this is not the, the seed of promise that God had been telling Abraham all the way back in earth. Follow me, I'll make your descendants greater than the stars in the sky and the sand in the, uh, in the sea. And, and so we see that there is now this sign of circumcision that is given for the covenant, is a sign of the covenant. This is God's covenanted people. And so uh, the mark of circumcision, it is symbolic that we are going to be men and women that follow after the Lord. It's the cutting away of the flesh. It is saying no to living with the flesh being the ruler over us. We will hold that in abeyance and we will die to the flesh in order to live to the spirit. Now, you remember that Jesus went on to talk about circumcision is, is nothing if it's not of the, of the heart. Paul follows that through that just a, a, an outward circumstantial mark isn't what it's all about. It's about a circumcision of the heart. It's about your heart being towards God versus the, the flesh. But this is going to be the, the covenant sign now for the nation of Israel. We saw that Abraham immediately uh, obeyed him and his household they uh, immediately were circumcised and uh, and so we saw that and taken care of you'll remember that then it was that the angel of the lord a a, a christophany a, a, a an earthly appearance now of Jesus pre-incarnate before uh, he came in his earthly ministry. And you remember, and there were two other angels that were with him, and they come and visit Abraham's house. And uh, you'll remember that they're on their way to Sodom and Gomorrah, and you'll remember that they fix a feast uh, for them. And, uh, and the Lord tells uh, Abraham that this time next year that uh, you are going to have your son through Sarah. And you'll remember that Sarah's listening at the tent and she hears that and she just laughs, you know. I mean, just, but she laughs in unbelief, you know. She looks at the impossibility of it. It's just absolutely impossible. She's 89 years old uh, and, you know, she is well past, you know, childbearing uh, age and so no cycles no nothing she's just dried up and old and and now God says you know that that she is going to to be rejuvenated back to back to life again that he is going to to bring forth and so we see here that uh, that in that later you know the Lord asks you know why did you why did you laugh and you remember how she says I didn't laugh and the Lord says oh but 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 you did you know and and the Lord sees our our, our heart but she was fearful and in that fearfulness we see that she compromised her integrity we talked about fear in the way that 
that when we are fearful, how that will push us to not walk in the spirit, to not walk in the light, to not be uh, authentic, to not make good decisions, to turn inward, to become defensive, to become protective uh, of ourselves. Uh, and so uh, we saw uh, all of this transpire. You'll remember that that the Lord then is going to uh, depart and head towards uh, Sodom and uh, going to destroy now the iniquity of Sodom and Gomorrah have, uh, have come to their fullness. And you'll remember then that's when Abraham becomes concerned because Lot uh, is now in uh, Sodom. And, uh, and so we saw those negotiations. Are you going to destroy the wicked, the righteous with the wicked? And and the Lord says, no, for 50, I, I will not destroy 50 righteous. With the, and, and you remember he goes to 45, and, and then he goes to 40, and then he starts going by 10s, 30, 20, <laughs> gets to, to 10. And the Lord says, no, I will not destroy it for 10 righteous. And, and the Lord departs. And, and so uh, we see now in chapter 19 that, uh, that the angels are going to arrive there uh, in uh, Sodom. In verse 1, now the two angels came to Sodom in the evening, and Lot was sitting in the gate of Sodom. And when Lot saw them, he rose to meet them, and he bowed himself with his face toward the ground. And he said, here now, my lords, please turn into your servant's house and spend the night and wash your feet. And then you may arise early and go on your way. And they said, no, but we will spend the night in the open square. We see that Lot is now sitting in the city gates. And when you were sitting in the gates, it meant that you were one of the governmental leaders. That was where the official business took place, was there uh, in the gates. And, and so we, we look and see how does Lot end up now as an elder, as a leader there in Sodom? Well, it began back in chapter 13. It began when Abram and, and Lot departed and Lot looked and he saw the plains and he saw how fertile it was uh, there and, and he looked and he coveted now with his eyes and so it started there with his departure. We see that in a few verses uh, later it says that he pitched his tent towards uh, Sodom. He wasn't in Sodom but, uh, but now he's leaning towards uh, Sodom, pitches his tent um, toward the them. In chapter 14, we see that he has moved now uh, into Sodom, no longer content to be at a distance from Sodom. He has immersed himself into Sodom. And now here we see in chapter 19 that, uh, that he is fully immersed and he has become this, this leader that is there in, in Sodom. We see the, the looking, the leaning the moving, and now we see him as a, as a leader in Sodom. We see all of that as those movements and toward, uh, toward Sodom and toward the things of the world. We see that this is a picture of compromise. It, it, it is the picture of, of, of staying away from evil, but then starting to take a step, a step, a step. It is that compromise that we see that normalizes what at one time we were shocked at, at one, one time we wanted no part of. Now we have grown immune to it. We've grown numb to it. We have normalized it. We see that it's, it, it's the exact opposite of what we find in Psalm 1. Psalm 1, blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. We see that there's a progression there. It starts off with, you know, not walking with the ungodly. Then it's not standing with the ungodly. Then it's not sitting <laughs> with the ungodly. And each of these we see is, is more of an investment, is, is more of a lingering, more of a longing, more of a partaking. It says, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. 
We live in a city that's known as Sin City. I mean, it has a reputation. You can literally travel anywhere in the world, uh, and, and people know Las Vegas uh, as uh, Sin uh, City. And we know that there is iniquity in our city, and, and there's iniquity in every single city. But, you know, once again, do we become accustomed to, to the sin? Do we become accustomed to the, the billboards? Do we come, become accustomed to, uh, to the sin that is around us and just kind of normalize? I saw a billboard the other day, and uh, it was for a strip club or something, and, uh, and it said, uh, ruining marriages since 1988. And, and I was just, I mean, it just grieved my you know my soul that 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 is the very statement that is you know that it is if that isn't sin being blatantly put into your face and you know and so the, it is so important with with our televisions and with movies and with all of these things that that our standards don't become eroded to what we at one time would say absolutely not but now we say well, only on occasion, or now it's no big deal. It's a really good storyline, honey. Just, you know, just close your eyes on certain scenes. And, it, and there begins this compromise to where that's not where, where we started. It's not who we're called to, to be. Listen, make no mistake about it. The culture has an effect on us. The culture has an effect on us. The Bible says that a little bit of leaven, what leavens the entire lump, that, that sin leavens and it spreads and it has that pervasive spread. Here we see Lot is this classic illustration and example. Now, we're going to see that Lot is known, listen carefully, Lot's known as a righteous man. In the New Testament, he is called a, a righteous man. And so he was able to be in this environment, but we are going to see that it cost him absolutely dearly. His compromise towards Sodom is going to cost him, listen to this, his entire family. It's going to cost him his wife. It's going to cost him his kids. Could he handle the temptation himself? Apparently he could. But you know what? What we do affects those that are around us, and they might not be able to handle the compromises that we bring into our homes. Parents, it is so important to, as the gatekeepers to your children and what you are allowing yourselves to partake of, even when you think that they don't know or that they're not uh, a part of it, uh, they, uh, they know, and they will follow in the footsteps of what is going on around them. And while you might have the freedom and and it might not affect you and the music that you're listening to and the entertainment and the movies that you're watching and and all of those choices though those are all permeating into the environment that uh, that you are establishing and and here we see that it didn't happen overnight it wasn't in a minute it was a slow progression over time we find Lot is now sitting at the gates uh, of the city there in God. And these two angels uh, show up and they are just going to kind of camp out in the courtyard, in the square. There will be inside the city uh, for the night. So cities provided uh, protection. But we see that Lot is not going to let them just uh, stay out there in the courtyard. He is going to uh, invite them into his house. But originally they say, no, we're going to spend the night uh, in the open square. But look, verse 3, but he insisted strongly. So they turned into him and entered his house. And then he made them a feast and baked unleavened bread and, uh, and, they, and they ate. So here Lot probably understands that, that it's not safe for these guests to be camping in the square. These are uh, two men, and he knows how defiled this city is with the regards to the sin of uh, homosexuality. And so he, he takes these two guys and brings them into his house. He, he, he has a feast uh, for them. And it says in verse 4, And now before they lay down, the men of the city... The men of Sodom, both old and young, and all the people from every quarter surrounded the house. And they called to Lot 
and said to him, where are the men who came to you tonight? Bring them out to us that we may know them carnally. So we see that, uh, that the sin of the men of Sodom is uh, connected to homosexuality. And make no mistake about it, the Bible is absolutely clear about the sin of homosexuality. In Romans chapter 1, when God is talking about there in Romans 1 is about the least amount of light that every single person is given, that God reveals light to every single person. And the least amount of light that he has revealed to everybody is nature. Nature, when the storms are storming and lightning is flashing and thunder is booming, you're aware of how small you are in the big scheme of things, that you are not the most powerful force on the face uh, 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 of the earth. Emma and I were traveling and uh, we were in a hotel and uh, I was standing out on the balcony and I was uh, overlooking the view and the stars were out and it's a really beautiful view. And, and I heard somebody on, a, on another balcony that was taking in the same view and, and they shouted out, I am God. <laughs> and I thought, no, you're not. <laughs> you know, you're sadly mistaken. <laughs> you know, you're feeling so mighty and so powerful over you are you are not God you know heavens uh, declare you know the glory of God and so nature has given to every single person a testimony that you're not the biggest thing that that is here secondly God's given to everybody a conscience and so that internal conscience that he has put in between right and wrong. When you violate that, you feel guilty. And God created man and gave every single person. So that's the least amount of light. And that's what Romans is talking about. And then he talks about that there are those that reject the light that has been given to them. And then they are given over to their reprobate mind. They're given over to now they want to be the God of their own life. And so they're going to just chase their heart and their heart's going to take them wherever they feel like. And it's going to take them into vileness. It's going to take them into lewdness and wickedness. That's, uh, that's where the heart is going to lead. And in Romans 1, it says, and likewise also the men, meaning once you've rejected the truth of God, once you've rejected the light that God has given to you, you're no longer, you have seared your conscience, and, and now you reject the fact that there is an accountability and, and that God exists. He says that you're going to give yourself over to your own you know, reprobate mind. It says, and likewise also the men leaving the natural use of women burned in their lust for one another. Men with men committing what is shameful and receiving in themselves the penalty of their error, which was due. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a debased mind to do those things which are not fitting. And so we see in Leviticus chapter 18, you shall not lie with a male as with a woman. It is an abomination. And so there, there, there's no question as God is not unclear on this matter whatsoever. And, uh, and so there are churches that are progressive that, uh, that say that homosexuality, that there is no problem with it and try and make a, a, a biblical argument uh, for it. But the, there is no biblical argument for it whatsoever and any way, shape, or form. Leviticus chapter 20 makes it even clearer. It says, if a man lies with a man as he lies with a woman, both of them have committed an abomination. They shall surely be put to death. Their blood shall be upon them. And so when God gives the law there at Mount Sinai, he is absolutely unequivocally with no shades of gray involved. He is very clear uh, on this. Now, I want you to know that sex outside of marriage is wrong. Whether it is two men, a man and a woman, two women, it doesn't matter. Sex outside of marriage, God has said that that is morally wrong and that is offensive and sin to him. Now, the problem is that when you take God's law and you say that that's not really the law, when you say that sin isn't sin, that that is where we have a problem. In our culture today, they're trying 
trying to teach the kids and they're trying to normalize sin and say that this isn't sin, that this is a healthy choice, it's a lifestyle, it's an identity, it's a gender issue, it's just who you're attracted to, it's nature, you can't help who you're attracted to. And, and so let, let's address that real quick. Sin is attractive. So it doesn't matter what you're attracted to. When God says no, then the answer is no. Amen? So same-sex attraction is not a sin. That is just uh, simply the temptation that you have. When you act out on it, guess what? That's sin. When, when you are attracted, when men are attracted to women and they have sex with them outside of marriage, that attraction is not sin. But guess what? Acting on that, that that is a sin. Having sex outside of marriage. That is a sin. Acting on that is a sin. So you have the temptation, you have the sin. And so the action is the, is the sin. Now, lusting in your heart, that also is a sin. And so that goes deeper as we get into the sin trajectory. But what is happening in our culture is that they are normalizing, seeking to normalize sex outside of marriage. They're normalizing that. And then homosexual sex outside of marriage, they're seeking to normalize that. Be very clear. God, God is not confused on this issue that he states exactly now having said all of that right it's not the unpardonable sin we want to love the sinner we want to hate the sin uh, and so again we have great compassion we have great compassion the church has great compassion upon everybody that struggles with sin in any area amen <laughs> we all struggle with sin we all have our own areas uh, of sin that we struggle with the issue is when you redefine what god has said is wrong and try and say no that's right when you're trying to change the standard of what god has said that is where we draw the line and we stand up and we say this is wrong there's nothing new underneath the sun same-sex attraction, homosexuality has been with us you know, from the very early days uh, here. We see how aggressive this was. We see that these two visitors come into Sodom and they now are surrounding the house to take these two out and to sexually rape them now. And they're telling Lot and calling him to release them to him. Probably these are two angels here, so they were probably very good looking as, uh, as angels. And, uh, and so here it says that old and young, it says that everybody gathered around the, the house. So we see how pervasive now the perversion was uh, in Sodom. Remember that Sodom now is going to, its wickedness has filled up and this is just an illustration of the wickedness that was uh, pervasive there in the city. And so Lot went out to them through the doorway, shut the door behind him and said, please, my brethren, uh, do not do so wickedly. See now, I have two daughters who have not known a man. Please let me bring them out to you and you may do to them as you wish. Only do nothing to these men since this is the reason they have come, come under the shadow uh, of my roof. So I have two daughters, two virgin daughters. Let me, let me offer them to you. You guys can do whatever you want to, to, to them, but do not do anything to the two guests uh, that are now taking shelter underneath my roof. This is, this is a hard passage, huh? You know, this is difficult to, to understand, especially for us because we have a Western culture mindset. Now, to understand this in any way, shape, or form, we have to, we have to understand what the Eastern mindset uh, was. In the Eastern culture, a guest in your house is due, number one, your respect and also your protection. And so there is a moral obligation. When you take somebody into your house, you have, in the Eastern culture, you have a moral obligation in order to keep them safe. And this is still even practiced today in the Bedouin communities. The person might be your greatest enemy, but when they are inside of your house, you now uh, have by honor to protect them and to keep them safe. So, you know, Lot here is a classic example uh, of a, a host seeking to uh, protect them, uh, even now to the point of where uh, he is uh, offering his virgin daughters into the crowd. Now, we also see that he has been in Sodom so long that we see that he also may be desensitized uh, to the perversion. Additionally, 
Lot might know that these are angels. He, he might know that these are not just uh, regular uh, men that he is housing here. And, uh, and so once again, this could be a piece that, that plays uh, into the factor. In, in verse 9, but it says, and they said, stand back. And then they said, this one came in to stay here and he keeps acting as a judge. Now we will deal worse with you than with them. And so they pressed hard against the man Lot and came near to break down the door. Now he came outside and has closed the door. And now they come up to him and they say, who are you? You're just a sojourner. You're just one that moved in amongst us. Who do you think you are rebuking us? You know what? It's going to be worse for you than what we're going to do to, to those two guests uh, uh, of yours. And so now we see the, uh, the threatening that has taken place. And, you know, it may be that Lot thought, you know, that I'm going to be able to, to use my spiritual influence to better this uh, environment, that, that my righteousness is going to be brought in and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be able to help turn this, this city around. And we see here that, uh, that now the, the, the rejection of his feeble uh, efforts at providing light to uh, these men and so the men reached out their hands, and, and it says, but the men reached out their hands and pulled Lot into the house so with them and shut the door. And they struck the men who were at the doorway of the house with blindness, both small <coughs> and great, so that they became weary trying to find the door. So the men press in, they grab Lot, and they're about to tear him apart. And the angels open up the door, and they grab Lot, and they yank him inside and close the door. And then they strike those that are right, right outside the door. They strike him with blindness. I got a question. You get struck with blindness. You, you, you're, you're trying to, you know, take these guys here and, you know, and, and suddenly you, you're struck with blindness. What, what would be the normal response now if you get struck with blindness? Wouldn't you try and make your way home and figure out what just happened? No, that's not what it says what happens. Look at what it says. They became weary trying to find the door. This makes it much harder, but now, you know, let's keep on looking for the door. You know, we're blind. We just has been struck blind as a judgment from God. And, and what happens? They, they tire themselves out, what? Fighting against God. We see the, the depth of the perversion now that is in their hearts, the lust that has now absolutely consumed them. Uh, and so they are absolutely determined in their in sinful practices. Then the men said to Lot, have you anyone else here, son-in-law, your sons, your daughters, and whomever you have in the city, take them out of this place. Listen, the Bible says flee evil. Just simply flee it. Depart from it. Get yourself away from it. Put it away from you. Get it out of your house. Don't compromise with the evil. Don't try and tame it. Don't try and make a pet out of it. Don't try and have a, a, a part of your life that's, that's given over to a secret sin. And that You need to just get it out of your life. Flee. Take them out of this place. Verse 13. For we will destroy this place. Because the outcry against them has grown great before the face of the Lord, and the Lord has sent us to destroy it. And so when Lot went out and spoke to his son-in-laws who had married his daughters, uh, so let's stop there for a second. Now, a minute ago, we just saw that he was offering his virgin daughters, and here we see that he goes and talks to the son-in-laws who are married to his daughters. So that can be confusing unless you remember that back then, again, they would betroth someone to another person, and they would have that period of betrothal. So they haven't been physically intimate yet, but they are legally considered uh, to be married. So his daughters are in a state of betrothal now. This is why they are virgins, but yet also considered relationally by family now to be son-in-laws. So <coughs> <coughs> 
He goes to the son-in-laws. And he says to them now, to those who had married his daughters, and said, get up, get out of this place, for the Lord will destroy this city. But to his son-in-law, sons-in-law, he seemed to be joking. So they would not take it seriously. Much in the same way when destruction was coming and Noah was preaching to the world and telling them that it's going to rain and get onto the ark and that the ark was open and all of the animals are going two by two onto the ark. They're going by the neighbors two by two. Wouldn't you think you'd follow after that? You know, when, when a whole parade of animals are just all by themselves going two by two by you and getting onto the ark. And here's Noah telling you that God's going to bring judgment and get onto the ark. And, and, and they wouldn't. Here, Noah, Lot, like Noah, is telling them that judgment is coming and you need to be safe. You need to come with us and we are going to depart. And it seemed to them that they were joking. When the morning dawned, the angels urged Lot to hurry, saying, Arise, take your wife and <coughs> your two daughters who are here and lest you be consumed in the punishment of the city. We see in the morning that there seems to be no urgency by Lot. The, the, the angels now are, are like, you have to hurry up. What's going on? It's like, ah, another cappuccino. I'm going to have my pastries uh, here and all. And, and we see that there is kind of this, this lingering that, uh, that is taking place. And so <coughs> they are pressing the matter. It says, look, in verse 16, and while he lingered, the men took hold of his hand, his wife's hand, and the hands of his two daughters, and the Lord being merciful to them, and they brought brought him out and set him outside the city. So they're kind of lingering and the, the angels grab him by the hands and they're like, we're going now. And they move out and they virtually drag him out of the city is the picture that you get. And they get him outside of the, the city. And so it came to pass when they had brought them outside that he said, <coughs> escape for your life and do not look behind you nor stay anywhere in the plain. Escape to the mountains, lest you be destroyed. It was difficult to get Lot and his family uh, out, uh, of, uh, out of uh, Sodom. A and yet, we see that, you know, that Lot is considered and called uh, a, a righteous man. A guy who offers his daughters uh, up, a man who lingers when the angels are telling him to, to leave. And yet we see in 2 Peter chapter 2 that, that, that Peter calls him a, a godly man. We see that righteousness, listen, is imputed on us solely on the basis of faith. That, that is where our righteousness comes from. I'm righteous and you're righteous, not because we haven't sinned, not because we haven't made poor choices in our lives or, uh, or bad decisions, but uh, we are righteous because we have confessed with our mouth and believed in our heart that, uh, that Jesus Christ is raised from the dead and that uh, he is our Lord and, and Savior. We see that here is a, just a powerful picture that God is going to rescue people even when they are hopelessly lost. We see that Lot was in the worst of all possible places. He, he had too much of the world in him to be happy in the Lord and he had too much of the Lord in him to be happy in the world. And and it is a place where, where compromised Christians end up living. They never experience the fullness of what God has. But everything that they're seeking to fill themselves with is not filling them and is only leaving them sadly dissatisfied. And they live in this constant state of frustration of one foot in each world wanting the things of the Lord, but, but wanting the things of the world at the same time. If that's you tonight, get your foot out of the world and step fully into the things of the Lord. 
It is only the things of the Lord that will satisfy your soul. It is only the things of the Lord that will fill you to overflowing, that will give you those rivers of living water that will burst forth into your heart and into your life. One foot in each world, you're a double-minded man. And the Bible says that a double-minded man is unstable in, in all of his ways. It is, the, it is the worst possible place to try and dwell in. And so they are dragged uh, out of the city. He tells them to escape to the mountains. And, and we see that Lot now, he, he disputes. Verse 18, then Lot said to them, please know, my lords, Indeed, now your servant has found favor in your sight, and you have increased your mercy, which you have shown me by saving my life. But I cannot escape to the mountains, lest some evil overtake me and I die. See now, this city is near enough to flee to, and it is a little one. Please let me escape there. Is it not a little one? And my soul shall live. So it's interesting that the angels take him out and tell him, Flee to the mountains. And he says, oh man, the mountains, something bad could happen to us in the mountains. How about this little town over here, this little city, you know, Zoar? How, how about if we just, you know, go over to there? Now, it, it, it's interesting because it doesn't even make sense that God would take him out of Sodom to save his life and to preserve him and then send him to the mountains to now be destroyed. <laughs> but What's happening is that we're seeing fear again. We're seeing the, the, the fear is making Lot not even see things uh, sensibly. And that is, again, what happens when we become fearful. And another reason why God tells us not to be afraid, don't be anxious, uh, trust in the Lord, listen to the Lord, obey the Lord, trust in the Lord. Verse 21, and he said to him, see, I have favored you concerning this thing also in that I will not overthrow this city for which you have spoken. Hurry, escape there, for I cannot do anything until you arrive there. And therefore the name of the city was called Zoar. So, this is a, a, a little town, a little city, and he says, okay, you can escape to that, but go quickly. Zoar will be spared. It won't be destroyed, and, and you can be safe. I favored you, but hurry because I cannot do anything until you arrive there. I cannot do, notice this carefully, I cannot do anything until you arrive there. This answers the, the question about judgment. It, it, is God going to destroy the righteous along with uh, the wicked? And the answer is no. We see with Noah how the righteous were put onto the ark and they were spared and they were protected while judgment comes. Here we see again that it says that I cannot do anything. In other words, I cannot bring the judgment and the destruction until you arrive there, until the righteous are safely protected, judgment uh, is not going to come. So we believe that scripture teaches, and I'm absolutely convinced uh, of this, in a pre-tribulation rapture of the church. This is exactly what this is a picture of. We are going to see the tribulation is going to come. It is the great tribulation. Such tribulation has never been seen uh, and, and never would unless it be cut in short. Revelation describes it beginning in chapter 6 and then uh, moving forwards the judgments that are going to be poured out. But does God pour out the judgments upon the righteous along with the wicked? And the answer is no. He says right here, I cannot do anything until you arrive there. What is the event that precedes the judgment of the great tribulation? The event is the removal of the righteous off the face of the earth. The rapture of the church clears the righteous off of the earth so that what? So that now judge can come upon the face of the earth. Others say, no, that the saints, us being the saints, the church, is going to go through the tribulation. It's like, no, that is not in typology. That is not in the nature of
picture of God that is not in the scriptures. You do not see that. You always see the righteous are removed and then judgment uh, comes. And so uh, here we see, I cannot, I cannot do anything until you arrive there. And so the question being answered now, uh, are the righteous uh, now judged along with the wicked? No, God knows uh, how to reserve the ungodly. Peter talks about the fact that God knows how to deliver the righteous, but yet reserve the ungodly for judgment. And, and so we are at that place in time prophetically, I just want you to know, that the rapture of the church could happen at, at any moment. That theologically, when we look at the events that need to take place, everything is in place for the rapture of the church to potentially be the next uh, eschatological event that takes place uh, in the word of God. Now, am I setting a date? Absolutely not. When things are in place, God will happen. It will happen at God's timing. But listen... The time is getting short. This is what we know. We are getting near. When, when you look at the alignment of the nations, when you look at the technology, when you look at a, a, a one world uh, opportunity to take place, when you see Israel back in the land, when you see that they want to rebuild their temple, when you look at all of the pieces that need to be in place, that have not been in place. So prior to 1948, the, the rapture of the church couldn't take place. Why? Because the nation of Israel wasn't even back in, in, the, in the land. And so we see that when the one world government steps in, when the Antichrist rises, who is going to uh, step in, he's going to negotiate a peace treaty with the nation of Israel. There was no nation of Israel, so there couldn't be uh, a peace treaty. You know, Christ can't return to the temple if there is no temple, if there is no nation. And so the events that now precede the the the, the, the judgment and the rapture of the, uh, of the church have to be very close to the timing to the rise of the Antichrist. It means that there needs to be a technology in place. And everyone got all excited. Remember, you know, when credit cards came out and it was like, oh, the mark of the beast, they're evil. And then it was like, oh, the numbers and the processors, they, they end in 666, you know, and all of these conspiracies there, you know, it's like, no, you know, it's not the, you know, the mark of the beast, but guess Guess what? It's moving closer. The digital technology being connected to where there can be a, a, a commerce that is now, you know, universal across the nation and, and across the world globally. And so we see all of these explosions of technologies. We see the, the, the way that a one world government could be set up and established. A, a one world economy could be uh, set up and in moments time uh, with the technology that we've got in uh, in place today. so all of these things now that needed to take place that were had not taken place and were precluding you know anybody i remember there was a 88 reasons a book by i think the guy's name was wise nut <laughs> which was fitting 88 reasons why the lord is returning in 88 1988 you know and so all the way back then there's all the reasons why you know the lord's re returning in 19 but the, there were so many parts and pieces that uh, that were missing, big, giant pieces that uh, that were not in place yet. And and right now we we are seeing all of those big pieces they're in place. So now the the, the stage is set. And now it is about whenever the timing of these things are, uh, are going to take place. But there is no additional big piece that, that has to happen. Israel is the prophetic time clock. And that prophetic time clock is ticking. And it is uh, moving forwards. We're seeing the alignment of the nations of Gog and Magog with uh, Iran. We're seeing the the the. the, the cup of trembling that, that Jerusalem is to the entire world. So, so we're seeing all of these things take place. Should we be nervous about it or worried? Absolutely not. Why? Because God knows how to protect the righteous and to reserve the ungodly for judgment. So we've got nothing to worry about. Now, 
not anything to be worried about, but is it anything to be excited about? It's absolutely to be excited about because the Lord is on the move and he is going to accomplish what he said he is going to accomplish. So what does that mean when I say that? It means that one day, listen, you're going to stand face to face before Jesus Christ and you are going to dwell for all eternity in the presence of the glory of God forever and ever and ever and that is something to be absolutely excited uh, about and so all of these things give you the assurance listen that every single word of the Bible is absolutely true that you can trust it and it has been a hundred percent accurate in its prophecies thus far and God doesn't make any mistakes and every single one of these prophecies are going to be fulfilled. All prophecies and promises of God are going to be yes and amen. And you can be like Sarah. You can listen and laugh uh, outside the tent like, how can all this take place, you know? And it's like, okay. But in the end, listen, God wins. Uh, and he says what he means and he means what he says and every single word of it is going to be uh, fulfilled. And so the sun had risen, verse 23, upon the earth when Lot entered Zoar. And then the Lord rained brimstone and fire on Sodom and Gomorrah from the Lord out of the heavens. And so he overthrew those cities and all the plain and all the inhabitants of the cities and, and what grew on the ground. And so rain, brimstone, and fire on, uh, on Sodom and Gomorrah. Now, it says that when Lot entered Zoar, it's interesting to me that when Lot is being you know, driven out of, <laughs> of Sodom, that he doesn't go to Abraham's house, that he doesn't go to his righteous uh, uncle, but instead he, he heads off to, uh, to Zoar, and now the judgment comes. It rains, uh, uh, brimstone and fire, and it says, but his wife looked back behind him, and she became a pillar of salt. So Lot's wife, she turns back. She was told, do not look back. And most scholars will say that the looking back wasn't, you know, wasn't this glance back, like this quick peek over the shoulder. It was a looking back and lamenting and mourning the life that was lost, meaning that, that you know, my home, my life, my friends, everything, you know, and it was that, that longing to, you know, to stay connected, to, to be back. Remember how the Israelites grumbled and when they were, you know, out in the wilderness and they said, you know, oh, we used to have leeks and onions and mm, such good meat when we were back in, in Egypt. It's like, yes, but don't you remember you were slaves, you know, when you were back in, in you know, in Egypt. And so this, this longing, this, this longing for the fleshly life, this, <clears throat> this looking back to sin and saying, oh, wasn't, you know, wasn't sin delicious, you know, and, and, and there is for a season, sin has its attraction, but uh, we see here that, you know, when God has delivered us and, and, and that we have been removed, that, that we are not to glorify sin or to look back upon sin. Jesus, in a powerful exhortation in Luke's gospel, chapter 17, says, remember Lot's wife. So Jesus himself validates this, uh, this incident. Now, scholars will, <laughs> will have their opinions and their debates about, did she actually turn into like a pillar of salt, like this statue of pure salt? And, you know, and some say, yes, that this was a special judgment of God, and he just turned her into a giant salt lick. And, and, and that is, you know, and that's possible. Others, you know, talk about the possibility of, of this being a bit of a metaphor, uh, meaning that, you know, that she turns back and remember that th there is this judgment that takes place. Many believe that it could have been a volcanic in nature, that it, it blew up 
uh, from, from volcano and then the fire and lava and the brimstone goes up uh, into the sky. Now there is a ridiculous amount of salt. There is a salt mountain uh, that is uh, there that's extremely tall, about seven miles long that, that, that geologists cannot explain how this mountain of salt is, <laughs> is there. It's not from just a simple uh, evaporation of the Dead Sea uh, that is down there. But that when she turns, that the volcanic fumes uh, overtake her uh, and kill her. And that was why don't look back because the fumes are going to be coming from uh, behind you. And that when she turns back, the fumes overtake her. She passes away. Uh, and that the debris and the salt that now comes down upon her kind of puts this coating <laughs> over her to where she's basically encased in this, you know, uh, in this salt. Which one is right? I don't know. This is what I know. She perishes because why? She looks back and longs with her heart. That is the judgment that comes upon her. God told him, don't. And she disobeys God, and we see the judgment that falls upon her. We also see Jesus validating this very story. So whether she was coded or completely saw, we see that, that Jesus validates the warning and we would be wise uh, to listen to that warning. In verse 27, it says, And Abraham went early in the morning to the place where he had stood before the Lord. And then he looked toward Sodom and Gomorrah and toward all the land of the plain. And he saw, and behold, the smoke of the land, which went up like the smoke of a furnace. And it came to pass when God destroyed the cities of the plain that God remembered Abraham and sent Lot out of the midst of the overthrow when he overthrew the cities in which Lot had dwelt. And so God judged the sinners uh, in the cities and the plains, but he also remembered uh, Abraham. And we see that he saved righteous Lot from the catastrophe. Verse 30, then Lot went up out of Zoar. He leaves Zoar and dwelt in the mountains. Remember, that's where he was told to go in the first place. And his two daughters were with him, for he was afraid to dwell in Zoar. And he and his two daughters dwelt in a cave. And now the firstborn said to, to the younger, Our father is old, and there is no man on the earth to come into us as is the custom of all the earth. At this point, they may have thought that the whole world had been destroyed, these daughters. They, they have seen all of Sodom and Gomorrah. They, they pass through uh, Zoar. They head into the mountains, and they can be thinking that they are the only ones that are uh, alive uh, any longer. They look, and our father is old, and, and there's, uh, there's no men. There's no man on the earth to come into us, as is the custom of all the earth. Come, let us make our father drink wine, and we will lie with him that we may preserve the lineage uh, of our father. So they made their father drink wine that night. And the firstborn went in and lay with her father, and he did not know when she lay down or when she arose. And it happened on the next day that the firstborn said to the younger, Indeed, I lay with my father last night. Let us make him drink wine tonight also. And you go in and lie with him that we may preserve the lineage of our father. And then they made their father drink wine that night also. And the younger arose and lay with him. And he did not know when she lay down or when she arose. And thus, both the daughters of Lot were with child by their father, the firstborn bore a son and called his name Moab. He is the father of the Moabites to this day. And the younger, she also bore a son and called his name Ben-Ami. And he is the father of the people of Ammon to this day. So we see that the Moabites now and the Ammonites, they are the descendants through Lot. So the Arab nations, the Arab people, they are the Moabites, they are the Ammonites, and they are the sons of Ishmael. And so we see that these are the descendants that are the perennial enemies uh, uh, of the seed of God, of God's people through Abraham and uh, Sarah, through Isaac, and through the nation of Israel. And so we see these consequences uh, now uh, are given all the way over to today. We see what the daughters, listen, how they were affected by Sodom. 
we see how their thinking and their morality and their decision making, all of that was, uh, was impacted. We see Lot loses his wife. We see his daughters are given over into these the illicit uh, relationship that fosters their children and, and into the descendants. And, and we see the decisions of, of Lot to look towards Sodom to pitch his tent leaning towards Sodom, to move into Sodom, and then to be sitting down in the gates of Sodom. This is the last that we see of Lot in the scriptures. He is not mentioned again. And while in the New Testament he is called righteous, and while he escaped himself, we see the consequences of him leading his family into Sodom had absolutely devastating consequences for the rest of his family. May, may we take the lessons to heart. May we not look, lean, move, and, and dwell in, in Sodom, but may we be like in Psalm 1. May we be men and women who meditate and delight is in the law of the Lord and who meditate in it day and night. May God fill us and refresh us and strengthen us to be able to love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. May we not have a foot planted in the world and in the kingdom, but may we be wholly devoted unto the Lord and be set apart for him and his good work. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for your word. We ask that you would just continue to do a mighty work in each and every one of us. And, and God, if there's any areas of compromise, any areas of where we're looking or leaning, God, would you reveal that to us tonight, right now? Would you create just a, a a dissatisfaction in our, in our soul and illumine the areas where maybe compromise has, has just crept in or is creeping at the door. And, and Lord, would you just minister to us right now to be able to just have houses and lives that are wholly devoted unto you. God, you love us. You have a good plan for us. And in your presence is the fullness of joy. Help us to not trade the things of the kingdom for the world, but to value what you value and to love what you love. It's in Jesus' holy and precious name we pray. Amen.